If you can assemble a Lego kit, you can taxidermy or prepare a mouse for a museum collection. That's our guest for today's episode, Emily Grassley, who got her start in science by sewing up a mouse. So quick warning about this episode uh, of talking about dissection in taxidermy in like cutting animals open and pulling out their squishy bits. If that makes you queasy or upset, you probably want to skip this one and maybe check out our episode about salamanders instead. But if you think dissection is gross and cool, definitely keep listening. Is there any option for thinking like it's perfectly not gross? You can also just think it's a normal part of life. (laughs) I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. And welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. This week, we're flipping the script. Instead of talking about science discoveries, we have a story about discovering science. Adam Kent, the Wolf Spirit 10M, asked, what made you decide that you wanted to get into taxidermy? I really didn't decide on anything. It was more like when I walked into the museum for the first time, it was like Charles Darwin descended from the heavens and whispered into my ear, go forth and scoop brains. That's Emily Grassley answering questions on her show, The Brain Scoop. The Brain Scoop is one of my favorite science YouTube channels. This is a little bit embarrassing to admit, but I'm a huge fan of the Brain Scoop and getting the opportunity to interview Emily was really exciting. Yeah, she totally jumped up and down and squealed. (laughs) Yeah, I got, I really love the Brain Scoop. (laughs) What surprised me the most when I talked to Emily was the fact that she wasn't so much into science for most of her life. Yeah, so I, I never really... Uh, wanted to be a scientist. I wasn't really interested in pursuing science as a career. Science had always felt intimidating to her. But it wasn't until I had the opportunity to visit a small natural history museum that we had on our campus that I kind of realized what possibilities existed in the field of science. A natural history museum has collections of preserved animals and plants and fossils, natural stuff. Emily had a friend who was working there. And she was posting pictures of what she was doing on her Facebook. And when she was just idly scrolling through her feed, trying to relax. In a photo album, she would have like a picture of two wolf skulls that were just separated from their bodies and and just sitting on a lunch tray. That sounds like, that's like serial killer. (laughs) Horrifying. (laughs) Yeah. It's weird. It would make me want to block that friend and try to avoid them when I saw them in the hall. Maybe report them to the police. (laughs) Just say. But Emily's different. (laughs) Honestly, it was like a, a morbid intrigue, almost. She started thinking differently about science. And it also made me start to think like, wow, you know, maybe science isn't what happens in a sterile lab environment. Maybe science is really interactive and and gross and, and intriguing. When you go to a natural history museum, most of what you see is the exhibits. But Emily's friend worked behind the scenes in back rooms packed tight with preserved animals. And so she brought me to the museum one day and, and walked me through the process of how, how one prepares a mouse uh, for a study skin to be put in a museum collection. So what's a study skin? Well, do you know what taxidermy is? So that's when like you go out into the woods and you like hang out for a couple of days and then you kill some animals and you take them home and you put them on your wall. <laughs> that's actually not a good explanation. <laughs> When you think about taxidermy, you know, those are animals that that look reanimated, right? They have these glass eyes and they, they're in these realistic poses and they're in a habitat, typically. A study skin can look like taxidermy, but it's more functional. So you give them just a basic tube-shaped cotton body and they're not supposed to go on display. They're not supposed to be beautiful. I mean, you can get some really beautiful study skins, but um, the primary function for them is research. So Emily's standing in front of a dead mouse on a tray. She's about to do a scientific craft project. 
And at first I was really apprehensive because I had never done this before. And I was like, I don't have a science background. I don't know anatomy. How am I going to do this? So she's supposed to just cut the skin off the mouse? And sew it back up. And she did not shy away. I definitely would have been like, hey, you can totally have someone else do this. <laughs> it was about as complicated as, um, you know, making a really basic sewing project in home economics class. You know, it wasn't difficult at all. Like if you can, if you can assemble a Lego kit, you can taxidermy or prepare a mouse for a museum collection. Except Lego kits don't have small intestines. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) But she thinks anyone could do this. I mean, that's what she says. And honestly, I don't know if I could. I'm, I'm not good with knives. I'm squeamish. I mean, obviously you'll need more practice to make it really good, but it wasn't, it wasn't that challenging. And, and I think that is really what, what kind of hooked me. So this little mouse gave her an epiphany or moment of realization that science wasn't what she thought it had been. It wasn't that I had like a morbid fascination with dead things. It was more of a, I felt like I was contributing um, to this greater cause, to this bigger picture thing, which was uh, contributing to a museum. I think everyone wants to feel like they're contributing to something bigger. And that was it for Emily. So besides being the pinnacle of awesomeness, why does Emily think natural history museums are so important? Well, Think about natural history museums as being like the libraries of life on Earth. If you want to know how people lived 200 years ago, you can check out a book written at the time, right? But when you want to know what life was like on our planet hundreds of years ago, you check out the museum's collections. And that's only going going to become more important in the next 10, 15, or 100 years as we continue to populate the earth as we continue to build cities. Um, we want to know what lived here and, and we're going to want to preserve it and have it kept in a safe place. And that's, that's really the function of, of museums. So Emily's stuffed mouse is now a part of history. Ooh, history. Everyone wants to be a part of history. So pretty much now all she does is stuff mice. <laughs> Not exactly. I am the chief curiosity correspondent at the Field Museum in Chicago, as well as the host and writer of The Brain Scoop on YouTube. I'm sitting here in the Hall of Mammals, surrounded by dozens of full mount taxidermy dioramas of every mammal species you can imagine from every corner of the globe possible. She gets to hang out with scientists and gigantic fossils. So we're here in oversized geology surrounded by dinosaurs and pretty much any other prehistoric life that is too big to go anywhere else in the museum. And we're here with Joyce Havstad, who quite possibly has a job title almost as great as mine. What is your role here at the Field Museum? Uh, People around here call me the philosopher in residence. And she still gets to hang out with the dead animals. Ooh, dead animals. Ugh. Let's try to describe that smell. What does it smell like? It smells like KFC if you leave it in the back of your car with a layer of water at the bottom of the bucket in 100 degree weather for eight years. I guess that sounds like a cool job. The big part of the job is helping other people get curious about natural history museums too. And so Emily told me the key to that part is just asking questions constantly. I think about what my life was like before I started asking questions about everything around me. And it seemed so boring. (laughs) It seemed so unfulfilling. Um, But now, you know, there's a lot to look forward to. So that's our show. Many, many thanks to Emily Grassley of The Brain Scoop for being our incredible guest. You can watch the videos we mentioned on our website, and we'll have a link to all her videos on our blog. Lindsay wrote and produced the show with Sarah Lentz, our associate producer, and I wrote the theme music. Make sure to find us on Facebook under The Tumble Podcast, where we post about cool science stuff like rainbow clouds and volcanic thunderstorms. Volcanic thunderstorms, wow! I know, those are, they're really cool looking. (laughs) Also subscribe on iTunes if you haven't already and leave us a review. 
They're really important to help other people find our science podcast for kids, which they might not know even exists. And join us next time for more stories of science discovery.